good morning. My name is Ada Skiles, and I'm the Associate Director at Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago. On behalf of Chapin Hall, I would like to welcome you to our Child and Family Policy Forum. We would like to thank those of you who are here with us today and those who are participating through our live video webcast. Today's program is entitled Collaborative Approaches to Teen Pregnancy Prevention. Public agencies, community partnerships, and policy research. I know you will find the conversation both lively and informative. Moderating our panel of experts is the executive director of Chapin Hall, Matt Stagner. Again, thank you very much for participating with us today. And I'll now turn the program over to Matt, who will introduce our panel. Thank you, Ada. Thank you, and welcome to everyone here at the Gleacher Center. We have about 100 people in the room here at Gleacher, and we have 500 people signed up online. So a great turnout for what I think we all believe is a very important topic to be discussing. Though we've seen lots of improvement in the teen birth rate over the last two decades, we also know that as an industrialized country compared to our peers, uh, we don't look very good on this measure. Today we're going to be discussing this as a public health issue with a particular focus on how partnerships can help us address this important problem. So we have a great panel. They will each speak for seven minutes or so. And then we will have hopefully about a half hour uh, or more for discussion, both with folks in the room as well as those of you who are online. If you're online watching from your office or at home, you can ask questions of the panel in two ways. One is to use Twitter and use the hashtag Chapin Forum, and the other is to send an email to policyforum at chapinhall.org. If you're in the room, it's simple. You just have to raise your hand, and uh, someone with a microphone will come scurrying towards you. So let me briefly introduce the panel, and then we'll get started. We have four great experts on this topic, all of whom approach this problem from a different angle. First, we have Jamie Dirksen, who is the Deputy Commissioner for Performance and Quality Improvement at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Then we have Karen A. Scott, who's the Founder and Medical Director of the Young Women's Health Initiative. She's a board-certified OBGYN uh, and in community-based practice at the Mercy Family Health Center. Third, we have Roger Shannon, who's the Program Manager for Peer Advocate for Health Options for Youth Program. And finally, we have Rupa Sishadri, who is a Senior Researcher at Chapin Hall. So each of them will speak again for about seven minutes uh, from their angle, uh, and then we will open the floor to questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Jamie. I am going to talk a lot about data, so I hope I don't bore you, but I think that it is so critical. And I was telling several people today that while I was preparing for this, um, I, I really think this is a public health emergency and a serious crisis that we have on our hands around teen pregnancy and teen births. Um, and I hope we walk away today with some um, opportunities and actions that we're going to take policy and programmatically um, from what you learned today. So this is just a, a graphic of the teen birth rates um, in Chicago, New York, and the US over the last 10 years. And I know you've heard lots of information, teen birth rates keep going down, they keep going down, and they have gone down um, a little over 40% in the US over the last 40 years, um, which is fantastic. Um, and in Chicago, they've decreased 33% in the last 10 years. So there has been significant decline but that does not mean we aren't still in a state of crisis. Um, Chicago is still one and a half times the national rate, and we still have huge disparities among those who are um, pregnant and parenting teens. And so I think you know, there are some important things to understand that you know, in the US, 9.3% of all births were births to teens. In the city of Chicago, 11.8% in 2009 were um, births to teens. And then, you know, just Matt had mentioned about other developing countries. Um, again, the, the birth rate in Japan is five for every 1,000 teens. The birth rate in Germany is 10 per 1,000. In the UK, it's 25 per 1,000. Canada, 14 per 1,000. In the US, it's 38 per 1,000. So 
We are in no competition with our peers. They're doing much better than us um, on this issue. I think some other things to consider are um, some important information about behavioral activity of teens. Um, and you know, in 2011, through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, 47% um, of youth who responded to the survey did not, um, or sorry, have ever had sex. In Chicago, it was 52%. And then of those, 39% um, did not use condoms in the US, and 35% in Chicago did not use condoms. And then even more so around hormonal contraceptives, um, in the US, 82% did not use contraceptives, and 88% in Chicago did not use contraceptives. So the concept of, you know, there's high sexual activity and low use of hormonal and barrier methods is concerning um, and something that we definitely need to address. So the next sort of area that I really want to focus on is um, the cost of teen pregnancy and teen births, and it's huge. Um, the estimates are around $11 billion um, in 2010 for the cost of teen pregnancy in the United States. Um, those costs consider um, the cost of child welfare, the cost of um, lost tax, tax revenue due to not being able to um, get good jobs, um, the loss of uh, the cost of incarceration for sons of, of um, for the sons of that were born to teen moms. Um, so there's significant costs to teen pregnancy in addition to healthcare costs um, for both the mother and the um, unborn child and born child. Um, but even more concerning, I think, and something that is, is, is where a lot of attention needs to be focused is around the public education piece, around um, what happens when someone is um, you know, pregnant or parenting and going to school. Well, the, the reality is they're likely not going to graduate. Only 40% of all teen um, moms graduate high school. And of those um, that don't graduate, only, um, <clears throat> excuse me, only 2% finish college by the age of 30. So their earnings potential, their, their opportunities in life are, are much less than those who are able to finish high school and go to college. Um, and if we don't do something about this, we're, you know, we are, our economy is going to continue to um, be worse. And then something else that I found that was super interesting, there are 14,000 school districts in the US, and 25 are persistently low performing. Chicago is one of those 25. And of those, one in five um, will be school dropouts. And so 20% of all school dropouts come from these 25 persistently low performing schools, districts, and 16% of teen births come from those 25 persistently low performing school districts. So even in particularly Chicago and these large urban areas, it's even more important to figure out how we're going to address teen births and teen pregnancy. Um, so this is sort of the good news um, that I have to share, is that there has been a significant shift from the federal government on how they are addressing and funding um, teen pregnancy prevention. So in 1981, the federal government started funding teen pregnancy prevention and did so in a in a relatively comprehensive fashion where they had um, care services funded, like contraceptive, access to care, et cetera, and they had um, prevention services funded or a combination of both. Um, not a lot of money, but it was still money that was dedicated to this, to this work. And then in 1996, welfare reform came along, and the Title V Act came along, and the shift went straight to abstinence only until marriage. Um, explicitly abstinent only until marriage, so there wasn't this opportunity to talk about comprehensive sexual health education or the benefits of using condoms or the benefits of using um, hormonal contraceptive, only the lack of uh, social emotional growth if you, you know, engage in sexual activity before marriage. Um, and that went on until 2010 when the Obama administration um, launched his teen pregnancy prevention initiative, which is fantastic, and the shift went from um, abstinence only into evidence-based. So all the monies, most of the monies coming from the federal government are now working towards evidence-based interventions. So they've identified evidence-based interventions, they're funding um, local health departments, school districts, community-based organizations, researchers to 
um, evaluate the effectiveness of these interventions in multiple areas across the country. Um, so Chicago is fortunate to be funded, um, one of uh, four school districts to be funded in the country to do this type of work. Um, and the government allocated $110 million to these types of um, interventions to be implemented with adolescents. And then there are other sort of funding streams through the federal government, like the Centers for Disease Control around HIV prevention and adolescent health, which just recently came out. So if anyone um, wasn't aware, there's a huge um, request for funding out right now around promoting adolescent health. Um, and so I strongly encourage you to um, look into that. $81 million are available um, under that funding pot. So we hope, and Chapin Hall will talk about this later, that what we learn from the implementation of these evidence-based interventions is that we really do need um, comprehensive approaches to addressing teen pregnancy. And um, the, the abstinence-only money that does still exist, um, $50 million a year, 29 states plus Puerto Rico still agree to receive these dollars and use these dollars to do abstinence-only education. Um, and so we, we hope there's a shift towards 100% evidence-based. Um, and then, you know, continuing this sort of focus on the intersection of public health and education, um, there couldn't be a better place to implement and address teen pregnancy prevention than schools because that's where the majority of youth are or we hope the majority of youth are during the majority of their, their time during the day. And so there are so many opportunities around policy to continue to, um, you know, forward adolescent health efforts um, around sexual health education policies, around access to care policies, condom availability in schools, school health centers, things of that notion um, in schools, bringing things and services to schools so that adolescents are more, um, have, have closer accessibility to these services. Um, I think that we really need to understand what are the best interventions with this population in the short period of time that we have with this, these groups of adolescents. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, we have their whole life from, you know, three to 18 in theory, where we can be promoting um, healthy decision making and respecting your body and, and relationship skills, et cetera, that we really need to incorporate throughout the school day, both in school and at home. Um, and then, you know, really thinking about what are our opportunities for school-based health services? What are our opportunities in partnering with community organizations to bring resources to schools? Um, our, my colleagues are going to be talking much more in depth about this, but I think that the opportunity is so great. And right now, um, the funding structures are in place to really help bring the two together for the first time. I think there's a huge political will that's needed. In Chicago, fortunately, we are very committed to teen pregnancy prevention. It's um, from a public health perspective. It's one of our 12 health priorities for the city. From an education perspective, it's definitely one of their priorities to deliver comprehensive sexual health education. It just passed a policy last month at their board. Um, so I think the, the stars are aligning and the opportunities are where we need to be. We just really need to maximize them and implement to the greatest fidelity and with the greatest rigor to ensure that the interventions we are, that we do have at our fingertips are implemented appropriately and we can prove the effectiveness because that is how the government is gonna continue funding our efforts is through evidence-based proven interventions. And that's all I have to say. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. Great, thank you. Next, we will uh, hear from Dr. Scott. Good morning. Uh, thank you again for the invitation and opportunity to share and to learn amongst friends and colleagues. And um, I wanted to, I have been reflecting on what I should share with you because I want to A, remain an advocate for ad adolescents, but I also want to remain focused on strengths-based solutions to improve adolescent sexual reproductive health outcomes. So from my perspective, uh, we provide evidence-based and evidence-informed programs and services specifically to first-time teen young mothers because we're trying to modify behavior so that we increase pregnancy and birth outcomes, improve child and health development, and increase family self-efficacy. And in the work that I do daily, I am wanting, I want to persuade you to kind of think of teen, unintended teen pregnancy um, and STIs in the context of unresolved child trauma. And if you've read the work of Vander Koch, um, when you look at unresolved child trauma and then the effect and transfer of that trauma across and within generations, that's really what I'm beginning to see as I look at young mothers who become pregnant unintendedly but choose to parent. And when you look in the backdrop of that, 
there is trauma. And there's trauma that they are parenting against and within in that generation and then beyond. So for me, my, my population, they're already pregnant. But my primary prevention is the next reproductive cycle, that next generation, because it's those children who will then carry on that cycle. So when you look at that, we are a byproduct of nurture and nurture, of nature and nurturing. So our nurturing is influenced by the quality of our caregivers, the extent of cognitive stimulation, and access to adequate health care and nutrition. And when you look at um, one-time or continuous persistent chronic or repeat traumas, some children will thrive because they're resilient, while others, the development will be compromised. So when you look at the literature, there are four family characteristics that have been identified that will increase the risk of a child entering kindergarten at a disadvantage. And that's where we're looking about success in life in school and beyond. And those four characteristics are living in a home with a single parent, living in poverty, having a mother with an education less than high school, and in a home where English is not the primary language. And if you have one or more of those family characteristics, then those children will present into school at kindergarten lagging in two areas, knowledge and social competencies. And that sometimes that gap can widen, it can persist throughout school and beyond to the point you may have increased federal spending or government spending for special education, grade repetition, dropout. Then you have a greater participation or reliance on public assistance. And then you keep going, sometimes a life of crime or delinquency and so on, where you have decreased government revenue because of decreased earnings and wages. So when you look at all of that, I'm still looking at the literature about what are the factors contributing to teen pregnancy and parenting, and it's linked to that kind of same biopsychosocial, medical, economic profile or challenges. So looking at that, we still begin to see where initially you have a teen within that context of their home life um, being exposed to probably decreased parent, excuse me, single parenting, decreased social support, fractured systems, decreased educational attainment, unprepared workforce, all that's already happening in the milieu of their lives, and then they give birth to that. They become pregnant by accident, but they choose to parent. And so when you have that, those children then are susceptible, again, to sometimes the child and social development. They may be born prematurely, a low birth weight, being admitted to the NICU. We then keep going with vision, cognition, and hearing impairment. So again, we get to kindergarten unprepared, not ready, and that performance is not where it should be. And so you begin to kind of see a cycle. Um, so again, as you're looking in the work of Van der Kolk is saying that these children where the greatest adversity they're living in have an increased proportion of kind of disorganized or very stressed behaviors as their normal repertoire. So when you look at adolescence, there's that aggression, there's that anger, there's high risk sexual behaviors, there are fractured, disrupted social unhealthy relationships, and then you bring that to their sexuality. Again, unintended pregnancies and STIs, and that cycle kind of continues, because as we know, again, that sons of teen moms are sometimes more likely to be incarcerated, and then teen daughters of teen mothers are more likely to repeat that cycle. So for me, being someone who's caring for teen moms, I am seeing second and third generation fill in the blank. So what we're wanting to do is to kind of break that cycle with across generations. So yes, we've heard that teen pregnancy in the United States has improved and we keep hearing about that. But when you look at racial and ethnic disparities in pregnancy rates, in birth rates, in their sexual debut or experience, in their contraceptive use, we still see a higher risk of African-American and Latina teen who are, who are not equipped with the knowledge, skills, the attitudes and behaviors, and sometimes the communication negotiation skills to have what we would say a positive, healthy sexual experience. And coming into the into obstetrics, the same kind of milieu here leads to that again, that increased preterm birth rate, low birth rate, NICU admission. So again, we see the cycle happen again, which is why for me, we created the Young Women's Health Initiative because we're bringing evidence-based practices and collaborative partnerships together to start a new cycle, to create a different circle of support and to revolutionize sexual, social, reproductive health behaviors and care for girls and young women on the south side of Chicago. So as um, Jamie was talking about, when you look at the United States and compare, she quoted the stats exactly for what this table is showing. When you look at the United States compared to other countries, we are suffering. Our health outcomes for adolescents are um, 
striking. And so Advocates for Youth, which I've been following for a very long time, um, they sponsor study tours to France, Germany, and the Netherlands since 1998. And what these countries have done is that they've transformed public consciousness or social thinking and implemented pragmatic governmental policies to where they normalize sexuality and pleasure and intimacy as a community, but specifically for adolescents. And with that, they have this unwritten social contract. We'll respect your right to act responsibly and give you the tools you need to, to avoid unintended pregnancy and STIs, including HIV. And that therefore has led to better improved sexual health outcomes in these countries. And in continuing in that work, um, Drs. Berm, um, Huberman, they presented a paper in 1999, again, this kind of model for a national dialogue. And they utilized what we call these four R's, which are really, um, again, being an advocate for adolescents and, and normalizing the fact that they're sexual beings. And I think that a lot of times is the difficulty is that adults are not able to just normalize that because it is happening. So with the four R's, what's key, number one is respect. All adolescents deserve respect and support. We tend to view them sometimes as problems as opposed to valuable assets and contributors to the program design, implementation, and evaluation of these programs and policies that we're wanting to implement to improve their sexual and reproductive health. Um, the other thing is that involves, again, valuing them and respecting them, we should involve them. So we very much promote peer involvement. Two is the rights or rights. And so there are rights that we believe adolescents need to have, and we should honor that. A right to accurate, honest, comprehensive sexual health education. And I've added to that, that is culturally, gender, age, and LGBTQ competent and responsive. The other thing is they have a right to confidential, affordable, accessible, quality, reproductive, and sexual health services. And they also have a right to caring and appropriate parents, families, and other adults. And so with that right, in this model, they believe that there comes a responsibility, that the responsibility then when you have access to this information to protect oneself and that of their partner against unintended STIs and pregnancy but to also protect one's own emotional and social health and development and that of your partner. And then the last R is research. They are uh, very committed to saying research should drive the policy or influence the policy. So adolescents deserve sexual health strategies based upon best practices um, that are determined through evaluation and research. Which leads to me to my relationship with Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health. And I put their mission there because I've been working with them since I um, have been developing this program where I have nurse home visits, uh, father involvement, fitness, nutrition, STI, pregnancy prevention, and parenting. And so they, it is a network of empowered youth and allied adults who transform public consciousness and increase the capacity of family, school, and healthcare system to support the sexual health rights and identities of youth. So we utilize them to help us with program development, evaluation, having peers come to train our, our clinicians, our staffers, myself, so that we are promoting a positive sexual health consciousness and framework. So these are the organizations between Advocates for Youth on a national level and ICA in Chicago that have framed my language, my behavior, my consciousness, my engagement with youth, and also being an advocate for adolescents. And what they're now helping me to do is, how do I translate this into medical education? Because this is not just your traditional OBGYN work. It really is in the framework of reproductive justice. Um, it's us utilizing skills from my colleagues in behavioral health and mental health, where you're going into the room and using reflection and motivational interviewing to engage and, and um, build trust with your team and helping them to move in that direction. And finally, it really is about harm reduction and minimizing that effect and transfer of these traumas across generations and cycles of families. Thank you, and if you have questions later, I'm open to that. Thank you. Next, we have Roger. Thank you, and uh, good morning for inviting me here this morning uh, to this important forum. Uh, I really relish uh, participating this morning. Uh, I frame my comments around uh, two key points. Uh, one is that uh, who should be doing the heavy lifting in regards to working with our adolescents and collaborations and partnerships uh, are key 
but we also begin to need to learn how to utilize uh, the adolescents in our community. Many times we have unrealistic expectations in regards to uh, what needs to happen in our neighborhoods and communities in regards to reproductive health and pregnancy prevention. Research and data collection utilize and the efforts have tended to focus on young women and as a result is less known in regards to strategies and effective approaches for developing programs for males. Uh, uh, our program, the Peer Advocates for Health program, uh, we began about uh, 12 years ago. We were at the University of Chicago Clinic and we had a program there for teen moms where we focus on the first time teen moms. It's called the Subsequent, Subsequent Pregnancy Project. And as we began to work with the dads, uh, we had a pilot project where we decided that we wanted to begin to make an impact in regards to preventing pregnancy. Uh, we uh, had a focus group with young men to find out what they felt needed to happen in the community in regards to preventing pregnancy. And surprisingly, they articulated to us some of the things that they thought needed to happen. The first thing they said was that uh, we needed to be better informed from them in regards to what they had to say about what was going on in their community. Example, we needed to be sensitive and talk to them about their educational needs. We needed to be sensitive and talk to them about how they travel to and from clinics. We also needed to be sensitive to their thoughts about what was happening in their community, i.e. violence and uh, other issues. Uh, we wanted to develop a program where these young men could be a uh, thoroughfare for other young men and women to get information about reproductive health. But we had a couple of barriers that we had to face. First of all, we wanted to take it to the next level. We wanted these young men to be able to help assist other young men and women to get to the clinic for reproductive health because it was our philosophy and our belief that if you help young adolescents to get to the clinic before a pregnancy, then you can prevent one. Uh, after we found out uh, that we needed to help assist them to get to the clinic, we had to identify some resources in the neighborhood uh, for them to get there. Unfortunately, it was a long travel. It was a transportation issue for us because some of the clinics that, that was near us, they weren't as adolescent friendly as they needed to be. So what we had to do, is we had to make sure that we made special provisions for them to be able to get to the clinic. We decided that uh, for uh, the young men, we wanted to increase their reproductive health knowledge, and um, we wanted to make sure that we, we also had what we call a hybrid program. Uh, the hybrid program was that we wanted to make an impact on the participants in the program to make sure that they had a healthy lifestyle. We wanted to make sure that they had all the educational resources that they needed. We also want to make sure that we help assist them in regards to becoming self-sufficient young men and also with the application process for college. Uh, to increase the reproductive health services, uh, we develop a linkage and a partnership. I want to give a shout out to Planned Parenthood, uh, Katie Ramos. Uh, she helped us in regards to uh, setting aside some of their valuable clinic space and time where we could help get adolescent men, young men and women to the clinic on specific dates for reproductive health checkup. Uh, now, the next point that I wanted to make was, uh, with our program, we had to decide uh, what we felt was most important prioritized what was most important for what we wanted to see happen. 
uh, we looked at a lot of different issues in the neighborhood, and one of them was the high incidence of HIV and AIDS, the high incidence of STDs, STIs, and also we wanted to do pregnancy prevention. Now, at first we thought that we needed to focus on one particular topic, but as we found out, as these young men became trained, that they could handle all these topics. What we did was we uh, decided to take young men from uh, uh, applications from 50 particular high schools in the Chicagoland area, and we took 30 young men, we trained them around reproductive health for eight weeks, it's sort of like a boot camp. Now, it wasn't for everyone, and some of the young men that applied, it seemed as though they were good, excellent students at their particular schools, but because they were excellent students, that did not mean that they would be a good person that would go into the community and be vested in regards to helping uh, uh, get information out and be a peer advocate in the community. Uh, we now have trained approximately 300 peer advocates. We have 25 in the program now. And what has happened is we've grown so that we have 10 that are in high school and we have five that are also students that are in college. Uh, another offshoot from us training the peer advocates was that uh, we began to get information from the neighborhood in regards to uh, other issues that needed to happen. For instance, uh, we found out where young men like to hang out how they felt about reproductive health, how young men felt about what they should and should not do in relationships. Uh, we also found out from, surprisingly, from these adolescents, what programs in our community and neighborhoods that were most effective. Uh, when the kids come back, they'll tell you how they were treated at a clinic. They'll tell you if they're getting any type of resources in their neighborhood. Uh, we also got a little bit more of detailed information in regards to how kids thought about what they needed to happen in the future and how that affected their risky behavior. Let me give you an example. Uh, many times, some of the guys, we would have focus groups and they would invite some of their friends and associates in and we would discuss with them why they were not using condom, why some of them felt that they should not use condom. And they, and they told us, they said, well, you know, if you really look at the violence in our community, I don't expect to be around in two or three years, so why should I use a condom? Uh, the other thing is that uh, we also learned from these young men how the best ways for, to get people to clinics in certain situations. Let me give you an example. Uh, in Chicago, in the south side of Chicago, which is an urban area, uh, uh, the clinic is quite a ways from where we're at. And sometimes young men, they knew routes to travel to be at their particular safest point. So those were the issues that these young men faced. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and that's my philosophy is that I think that if we're going to be successful in helping our adolescents and young men and young women in regards to teen pregnancy, we have to begin to advocate to give them the necessary tools that they need to be successful. They can do the heavy lifting around this issue if we give them the things that they need to work with. Uh, in summary, uh, I would like to say uh, in this economic climate now, uh, with uh, reduced federal, uh, state, and private funding, uh, uh, what a better way to save money than to have our kids help us to do the work that we need to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Our final speaker will be Rupa. So hi everyone, I hope you're all as excited about the previous three speakers that I've been. Um, I think I've learned a whole lot in these last 25 minutes. Um, then the many, many, many articles I think most of us have been reading over the years as we work on this topic. Um, so I think all three have mentioned, and I wander a little bit, so please tell me if 
my voice fades. Um, all, uh, I think all three of my colleagues up, up here have alluded to or spoken directly about programs that they're engaged with or have been working uh, in in some capacity over these um, over their careers. And a lot of them, a lot of that really comes from evidence-based research. So I had a little slide up here just highlighting what exactly we mean by it, because I think more, I, I would say, this has been around for a while, but it's gained a lot of traction in the last decade or so, perhaps, especially in this um, environment we face about scarcity of resources. So there's a whole lot of pressure that you know, any kind of programming, any kind of services out there that we are pouring resources into that it actually realizes the results that we hope it will. So evidence-based research is basically, to, to put it very simply, is one where the, you know, the, the main idea basically stems from some theoretical underpinning. There's a good rationale for why, at least in theory, something should work, and then you implement it, study the process and the outcome, and then if you're able to relate the outcomes you see to the theory that kind of supported it to begin with, there's your evidence base, right? And so often, you know, in, in uh, when you talk about teen pregnancy, it can have to do with, so I'm talking about her bullet point here, where really the evidence we're talking about is that behavior change and the risk factors that we see that may be associated with teen pregnancy really can be explained hand in hand. Uh, so more recently, you know, so you have this evidence base, but we are currently actually implementing a lot of these evidence-based strategies to generate actually really additional information and, and evaluation of those strategies, um, often because we're implementing a previously validated strategy in perhaps a new and more challenging setting. Uh, so the national research agenda around this is pretty large right now. Jamie spoke a little bit about it, um, about the, uh, the current funding, I would say, last year. Our numbers are different, 110 and 105 million, but I do know that one year it was 110 and the other year it was 105. I think currently we're in the 105 million range, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but those are like per year. And then you have PREP, uh, which is personal responsibility for education program, I think. Um, but that's already $75 million a year for five years. So there's a lot of money out there that's being poured into all of this. Uh, in addition to that, you have the CDC and OH are partnering to um, support public and private entities. There's, I think, about eight to ten or so in the country, and these are much larger programs to implement a lot of these evidence-based uh, teen pregnancy programs. Uh, so most, most of these evidence-based programs really have those that you know, prioritize youth development, uh, focus a lot on this whole caring adult and the influence of this caring adult on a child's life, uh, which in turn then helps them think about their future and set future goals in addition to sex education. We, and that's kind of all of this is really what, what we mean when we talk about a comprehensive approach to teen pregnancy prevention. Uh, so this, um, so I, I think Karen mentioned this, how this whole you know, research and policy and how they all are so entangled with each other so here's, uh, so I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about what I think is a fantastic example of how, you know, this really went from research to policy and then back to research, just to show that how it's really, that synergy is really important for us to kind of make good progress in, I would say, not just teen pregnancy, but anything. So this is a study that, uh, it's called the Midwest Study for short, and I will right away profess um, um, not great knowledge about it because I was not a part of it, but Chapin Hall was involved. There's people in that corner table out there who you can talk to about it after uh, if you want to learn more. But the Midwest study uh, uh, basically they identified that nearly that this was a three states to three city, three state study um, where they um, identified that nearly half the kids, the uh, girls who were in foster care, at least in this study population, had been pregnant at least once by age 19. So that's a really, really, really large number. Uh, so, you know, your first, your first thought is, all right, perhaps these are kids who don't have access to much resources to the relevant education, uh, but the study was really more about learning, really what is it, what are the barriers, what are the risk factors, and the two, uh, two of the things that really stood out is that 
a lot of them really talk about having a child really as their way of forming their own families. That kind of validates things for them. That's like creating a family that they never had and trying to see how they can be perhaps different from their own parents were and see if they can be better parents. Um, on the other hand, they also don't necessarily have the caring adult in their life to help them make these informed decisions and you know, just be thoughtful about things. Uh, so that then in turn, um, well, I don't know if it led to, but then also there were the DCFS, the Department of Child and Family Services in Illinois, uh, convened this work group to uh, talk about and learn more about uh, delaying primary and subsequent uh, pregnancies and parenthood. Uh, so they, obviously, the Midwest study results were, you know, were part of the discussion. And so there's the policy piece where they then determined that uh, let's take this to heart and see if this is indeed a risk factor, so to speak. What if we provided that training to foster parents and caseworkers who are the ones who are actually engaged with these kids more often than not, and they can step in that role of that caring adult? So, so now it's back to the research table. So DHS uh, collaborated with DCFS to make this happen. So this study is currently underway where they are. There is a curriculum that's been developed. They, it's in the field. And since it is a research study, they will be collecting information and so we'll learn about whether, you know, yes, you, and I think, you know, Roger also mentioned that you really talk to the kids and learn from them what is it that you need and then try to provide those services back. So hopefully we'll soon know, soon as in, I don't know, three years. Um, uh, I'm going to take my word for it. Uh, but we will eventually know whether that was a feasible thing, that it, does it really help, uh, help these kids in the way we're hoping. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the, and I think this ties in a lot of uh, what Jamie and Karen have spoken about a little bit about, uh, Roger also, uh, some of the teen pregnancy work we're doing in schools in Chicago. Uh, I'll talk a little more about the first one because at least I'm personally involved with that and hopefully I'll do it more justice. Uh, but the teen outreach program, uh, which is being implemented in, in CPS, this is in partnership with ICA and Planned Parenthood. So this is truly, uh, I think, a great partnership because it has, you know, it has its agency, it has uh, other organizations that are in the business of providing direct service and care to our young uh, adolescents out there. And it is very much an evaluation study. So this is, it has a program evaluation piece and a uh, outcome evaluation piece, both being really important. Um, so the teen outreach program is one that's been around for a couple decades, um, but this is kind of its first major implementation in such a large urban school district. It's a positive youth development pro curriculum, which includes, since it's really a year long, it has pretty much every element in there. But like, uh, like many other evidence, uh, many other such programs, the focus really is on educating and informing our adolescents to the extent that they are able to make really informed decisions. And you know, and this goes back to what Karen said, we talk a lot about unintended pregnancies. And often, I mean, it could be, one of the reasons could very well be that it's been, you know, it's the, it's the ability to make an informed decision. So hopefully, you know, so you really kind of need everybody, I think in this room, to play their role in making all of these things happen. Um, and there's a lot of talk about you know, the, the social costs of uh, unintended pregnancies. And especially with this particular uh, study, we are also, the, the, the program is actually designed to also positively impact post failures and suspension. And a lot of things do go hand in hand because the idea of positive youth development really has overreaching endpoints and hopefully they're uh, preparing kids to make an informed and you know, judicious decision in not just getting pregnant or not, but in other aspects of their life, and just realizing what's best for them for their own long term success. Um, from from a similar funding stream, actually. So we're all, uh, there's a there's a second uh, uh, evidence based evaluation that Chapin Hall is involved with, which is uh, by D2F, and so there they look and it's an, that's an after school program, and they look at uh, in addition to pregnancy sexual activity and rates of contraception and fund abuse. Um, so there's a lot, lot, lot going on nationally. And I think over the last 10, 15 years, there's this constant dialogue back and forth between 
policy and funding and research and then taking what you've learned from research back and implementing it and then learning and you know tweaking the programs as you need sometimes. Um, that's really all I have, so thank you very much. And I was instructed to hit um, next. So I did it. Great. Thank you very much. So we will now open the floor for comments and questions to the panel from both those online as well as those in the room. The uh, first question that I got online, I will start with as people in the room are beginning to think about their questions, which is about the role of religious players in the community. So we want to be community-based. We want to use the strength of all of the partners and communities we can, but we also know that sometimes there are conflicts of values around the best methods for preventing teen pregnancy. So I don't know if any of you would like to uh, take on that difficult subject and say a few words about uh, maybe some success in reaching out to religiously based organizations in the community. <laughs> We're all blank. <laughs> I didn't say the first one would be the easiest one. Uh, in, in the past, we, we uh, had several programs where we reached out in the community to uh, a couple of the churches, one of them in the, in the Chicagoland area, High Park Union Church. Uh, they did a, a, a shout out to uh, Reverend Susan Johnson. They did an excellent job in regards to helping us in the community had the resources for our guys to travel. They had a van and for our guys to travel out in the community and talk about the topics in regards to HIV and AIDS. Now, uh, the other piece was that uh, we wanted to expand and do further exploration in regards to working with other churches in the community. And what we actually found out is that as we began to approach those particular uh, churches, um, some of them were uh, real friendly in the beginning in regards to working and collaborating with us. But as we moved up administratively, uh, it became a little bit more difficult, and we, be, and we and we did receive some barriers in regards to working with those churches. So it was a mixed bag, some good, some bad. <laughs> good, we have a question in the room over here. Okay, Hi. if you could. I, I don't know if I need to stand or not, but um, I wanted to respond to that and also ask another question. Sure, I'm if you sorry, could tell us Yamani your Hernandez, Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to say was just about religious organizations is that in Chicago anyway, there's um, the Reproductive Health and Access Coalition and the Religious Coalition for Reproductive um, Justice is, is a part of that coalition. So there is definitely a, a faction at least of the religious community that supports these issues. And I think we have to do better about pulling those folks into these conversations um, so that people don't get to use the excuse like, oh, but the religious people aren't on board because they're, they're, they are. Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention about that issue is just there was recently a poll done um, like literally just been pub publicized in the last month um, about um, African-American views on contraception, abortion, and, and um, sexuality education. And it revealed that over 85% of religious African-Americans are on board with this stuff. Like they, this is, they measured people who go to church more than one time a week. So um, like people who really identify as religious. So as we're talking about, um, health disparities and who's being impacted by these issues and knowing, you know, saying that a lot of this is African American and Latina youth, um, those communities still support this. So we have to not use that as a crutch. So sorry for that long um, <laughs> response, but I wanted to make sure that got out there too. Um, and then the question I wanted to ask was just, there was a lot of talk in the beginning about the cost of teen pregnancy. And I, um, I don't know if people have seen the ads that have that went out in New York recently, they've received a lot of controversy um, about talking about the cost of same pregnancy. And I wondered if the panel could just respond about how we talk about um, wanting to make change in this area, but not also like shaming young parents who, who have made the choice to parent and um, don't want to be treated um, as subhuman because of a choice that they made. 
Great question. Who would like to go first on that? Karen? Can I also add to the religious part? <laughs> and then I'll and also answer that question too. Um, and I, there's a national organization that's a religious coalition for reproductive choice nationally. And um, we, we are wanting to start like a faith-based initiative. I, I, and I believe the challenge is public and privately, you know, public conversations versus private conversations about sexual behavior within the context of abstinence before marriage. And I think one of the ways we are now working to develop on uh, strategies dealing with those who are currently pregnant, because that's obvious for those who attend worship services, when you see the teens walking around with their children, someone has sex. And so instead of using those kind of trigger words, it's the messaging. So with our home visiting program, they're already moms. They're already pregnant. So we don't go in at least, it's not a primary, but it's a subsequent. So in the context of promoting values that align with faith-based organizations, so it would be, it would be becoming a competent and nurturing family, how we build capacity and strengths around that. So we're trying to change our messaging so that we focus on family and strengths, being uh, self-sufficient, um, being you know, a model for your child, and the same kind of values that are promoted within those organizations or those services. So it, it is, or I believe it has a possibility of working for subsequent prevention, but the initial primary, I think, again, is gonna be the challenge because you then have to really address those words that don't wanna be said. And then in response to what um, Yamani asked, that is what I learned from ICA really, is that I was always, oh, teenage prevention, teenage prevention, pregnancy pre prevention. And so I went to a meeting sponsored by ICA where parents were in the room talking. I think it's when the video was made, when they choose to parent. And that's why in my opening line I said, I want to remain an advocate for a parent and not shame them even more than what the families and communities and everyone else from employers to schools who force sometimes girls to go to a school that they don't necessarily need to go to. And I'm writing a note to say right the elevator when you can walk when you're pregnant. I mean, there's so many things on so many different levels um, where we are trying to hide something that's there. And so it does not help the issue. And, it may be an unintended pregnancy, but it's a choice to parent. And when they make that choice, I believe we need to support them. So again, we break those cycles because it will continue to go if we shame the mother and the child when she's making a choice, whether we agree or not, but she's wanting to parent. And I believe we need to support her and her family in that context of who was family, who was support to her. And um, one of the models for our home visiting program is the smallest amount of change. Only the smallest amount of change is necessary. And so really trying to promote behavioral change and being um, strengths-based and not problem-based. I think it's a lot with how the context and the language that we use. And I just want to add, I think there's a fine line between um, the messaging around pregnancy prevention and, and all of the sort of stats that we throw out about, you know, who's pregnant and, and how much it costs and the education um, disasters that come from that. And I think that there has to be this healthy messaging around primarily we want adolescents to make responsible decisions that will help them be successful in life. And, you know, and, and reality is that means that you probably shouldn't get pregnant. And there are things you can, you, we, you know, you can have sex. There's responsible, healthy ways to have sex without having a, a, a child. And, um, and when they choose to have a child, we need systems, I mean government systems in place, where that child is supported, where that mom is supported, where their child can be in daycare at school or next to their school so that school is not a barrier. So removing those barriers for the adolescents who do get pregnant, who choose to get pregnant, to ensure there are support systems in place so they can still be successful in life um, despite the um, barrier that has been put in front of them. So, great. We have a question in the middle of the room there, the gentleman in the green shirt. Um, th this is kind of a general question, but I'm really. Uh, if you could, uh, that, again, uh, the question tell us your name. For Roger. My name is James Parker. I'm with uh, the Department of Children and Family Services, great. Office of the Inspector General. And um, when we talk about, I really commend all of you for the work that you do, and, and I'm particularly interested in peer education. And um, when we're talking about reproductive health and condom use, in, in any of your programs, do you touch on the idea that, um, I hate to use the word down low, 
but to also be able to talk to young men uh, about um, sex, same sex uh, in, uh, engagement and, and how that can relate to the spread of HIV because there is, I think, uh, an incidence, a high incidence of um, male to female transmission of HIV and how exactly, you know, do you handle that? Oh, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, to be honest with you, yes, we do. We, we do address it. I mean, we try to take a very comprehensive approach about reproductive health. Uh, we, we, like I said, it's eight weeks and we have to talk about uh, their sexuality, about gender bases, about domestic violence, about condoms, and for them to understand that condoms are not 100% effective. That if you want them to be effective, you have to use them with contraceptive foam and film. Also, just because the men, just because they're men in our program, we have to make sure that they're vested in also learning about all reproductive health and all contraceptive methods. I mean, we need to start to be, teach behavior for young men to learn about all contraceptive methods and also about reproductive health in regards to same gender sex, everything. Uh, uh, a big part of it is that uh, when, we, when we bring guys into our program, what happens many times is uh, some of the young men, they say they're not having sex, okay? And we have a, a, a brief survey. But by the time they begin to bond and they understand about relationships, about you don't have to be sexually active, it doesn't make you a man, uh, then we, it, comes, it begins to come out that they're not sexually active. Some of them are not actually sexually active. Some of them are, uh, but they know that what the consequences actually are. So it's a lot of work that needs to happen, but to me, for eight weeks, nine weeks, it's well worth the effort when we get uh, a, a very, concentrated effort of peer educators out in the community that can do the heavy lifting. And again, I'm gonna keep referring back to ICA because they helped me with that, but during that uh, TT, is it TPP and prep time when the federal government announced funding, one of the programs that was uh, identified by the CDC and OAH as an evidence-based HIV STI prevention program, which will then lead to pregnancy prevention because you're using you know, barriers and everything else, is CLA, Sisters Informing, Healing, Living, Empowering. And that is where it's a peer led with an adult, and it's specifically for African-American sexually active females, 14 to 18, and with that, it is done with a peer. And it's based on, as Rupert was saying, a theory. So um, social cognitive theory and theory of gender and power. And what it really is is how do you make it culturally relevant and age appropriate. So you're talking about what is unhealthy, unhealthy, what is a relationship, what are power and abuse, and really with models, with condoms, like we can turn a male condom to like a dental dummy, like, and it's using a peer. The adult is present to prom promote fidelity to the model, but the peer is really driving all the conversation, the education, the interaction, the role play, and then we have the um, participants replay, and at the end, that's how they graduate. So they model what the peer and the adult are doing. So I agree with you that having a peer to peer, we know that is the way they learn, the way they interact. Um, and also, even for me as seeing females, I do talk about same gender, not necessarily pregnancy, because it's two females, but definitely for protection barriers. And then I also talk to young women about men who have, men, who have sex with other men. And again, it's how do you help a how do you empower someone to ask questions, to communicate and clarify values and goals and see if your sexual behavior aligns with your value and goal and that of your partner? And so it's a process because even adults have a difficult time doing it. So when you're doing that with peers, it's amazing because they then learn this is passive communication, this is aggressive. So I'm not gonna, we're not gonna get what we both want. So how do we both have sex but both be safe? And having a youth um, be able to negotiate that is very empowering. So though I may not see guys, I'm always talking to young women about you know, men who have sex with men, so then you can ask those questions. If you can't ask if he's having sex with someone else, be it male or female, maybe that's not the time for you to have sex. And so it's helping them to decide, you know, we say red light, yellow light, green light. Like, do you stop, go, or hold? So that they can conceptualize that. You know, what we're wanting them to do is a lot. It's higher level thinking that, again, adults don't even do well. 
Um, so, and I'm not saying that I'd be disrespectful, it's just that we're, we all need to be engaged in this process so we can continue to have positive behavior be persistent through all adults and, and, and youth. Great. Um, here in the front, if you could wait for a microphone, please. I'm, hello? Oh, I'm Dominica McBride. Um, I'm with Become. Uh, we do program evaluation and organizational development in um, marginalized communities. And my question is around collaboration specifically for Karen and Roger, but of course anybody can um, chime in. Uh, what have you found to be effective in collaboration? So strategies, processes, tools, um, you collaborate with another organization, you collaborate with youth, so if you talk about it from your different perspectives, and then specifically for Roger, um, what have you been, what have you found to be effective with the youth in keeping them engaged um, throughout the process? So helping them to be the best peer advocates they can be and then keep them engaged throughout um, the whole program. And then how long is the program? What exactly are they doing you know, out in the community? All right, thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, the program lasts for uh, what we try to get young men that come into the program when they're freshmen in high school, and it lasts all the way through high school. And even if they decide to go to college uh, in the Chicagoland area, they can still be a part of the program. Uh, it gives us the luxury uh, uh, when we have uh, requests for presentations for the guys that are in college to have a lot like a more flexible schedule to participate at other high schools and, and things of that nature like after school and stuff. Uh, the other thing is that uh, in regards to collaborations, uh, we have to learn to listen to the guys that are in the program. When we began the program uh, years ago, we used to interview, I personally used to interview the guys uh, for the program, and we didn't have a very high retention rate. But after that first year, they, they told me to step back. We got this, Mr. Shannon. <laughs> and they began to interview the guys, and they had a good feel for who would be a good peer advocate. So uh, since then, they have a Dave Howland selection process. The other thing is that uh, we are we always, we're constantly having focus groups with, with, with the guys. They bring their friends in, they, their counterparts in, and we get input from them. But we also have workshops that we let the guys run. We call them the Let's Talk About It series, where we'll look at, uh, we'll let them decide what are the most important topics that they feel need to be addressed in the community. And we will invite uh, kids in with a raffle, students in with a raffle where they can come in, and they run the workshop. They basically run the workshop. Uh, but as far as collaborations, uh, when we get that input back from them, uh, uh, they have to sit down and they decide and tell us what they felt went wrong. Sometimes it might be where they go to a clinic is just one particular person that they might have a problem with. A part of the training for them when they begin the training is they have to be able to have the ability to go out and interview someone at a health facility somewhere in the Chicagoland area. So they began to get a feel about health issues. They began to ask questions about their concerns about health issues, and then they have to come back and present that to the group because we want them to be vested in health issues in their own community. Uh, the other part of it is that uh, after the eight-week training, we uh, divide them into a groups where they have to do a formal presentation to uh, uh, the community, uh, family, and friends uh, uh, to help prepare them for their one-on-one -on -one or group presentations later on. Karen, did you want to add to that? Well, so we, we serve, um, we have the capacity to serve like 100 first-time team moms, so we have 65. So one of the moms who's the longest standing, she spoke at our one year, our first year anniversary as one of the second main speakers. She's a team mom, she's in the National Honor Society, she's the editor of her yearbook, she's on the honor roll. She went, I believe she went to DC and she either performed or sang for the inauguration. So she's truly very motivated. And so for our girls, the 65 that we have now, um, it's the engagement. And so my collaboration with ICA, I did not want to build this organization without what I read, like the four R's. I needed to have someone who truly respected adolescents and really promoted 
a positive, that's where my lingo comes from, it was like a positive sexual health experience. I can say that without judgment three years ago, not sure. But I can now because I understand what that means is that I'm not judging. If you choose to do this, I want you to be healthy and that of your partner. So with that, I think the, the youth are open. As soon as you do that, like, oh, and they just start sharing versus, the, you know, the permissive, not permissive, the dismissive, avoidant, the rejection part, it comes from all of us on different levels and we're not aware. So ICA really helps with me at, as the administrator as well as with the staff, with development, with trainings. They provide the youth and the adults who help us do that. We just finished CLA in the month of February, 16 girls, total nine graduated, and we had two, um, two youth from ICA, and one of the youth is a parent. So having, again, that peer, whether they're, especially being a parent who's in school and working with me, um, it's amazing because the girls get to see, wow, she's a mom, she's 20, she's in school, she's doing this type of work. I can do something else with my life and use my experience you know, to be an advocate. So that's the biggest thing is empowering them to be an advocate for themselves and like you said, and what they're already doing. So how do we, um, how do we, you know, use that to everyone's best ability? And for collaborations, it's just having someone who, li who will sit down and listen and, and you ask questions and aligning your mission and your value. And I feel like it's just amazing when I work with ICA. Um, and they, again, helped me to realize that this is a reproductive justice and it's harm reduction. So that's why I keep saying that's the context in which we really exist and it works for us. And so um, I think that, that collaboration is constant. It's engaging multiple ways of communication. We plan, we strategize, we meet, we talk, we get feedback. And so they're very accessible and available. That's, a, that's great on the community level collaboration. Jamie, do you want to add anything on collaboration from the government agency perspective? What, is, what does it mean? What are the challenges? But quickly. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> um, it means it's very important. I see my partners at CPS in front of me. Um, it's essential, constant communication, um, and ensuring, you know, it's, it's not easy, I will say. Um, every, each large government organization has multiple priorities. Um, and, you know, in both of our organizations, teen pregnancy is, you know, the education organization, their priority is to educate students. Our priority is, you know, teen pregnancy is a much larger priority from a health perspective um, and, you know, much clearly in line with our mission. It's, it's, it's a little more challenging with CPS just because their primary mission is to educate students. It's not necessarily to educate them about not becoming pregnant. So, um, but I think that we've had a really great collaboration that there is, there is a sense of importance, there is a sense of need, um, certainly you know they applied for the grant they got the grant they're implementing the grant so I think that you know we'd have to continue to to figure out the best way to align the mission within the larger mission to be as successful as we can be and we can't do that without constant communication and constantly building relationships across the systems um, and that you know takes time and commitment great uh, in the back I'm Jan DeCourcy, uh, formerly with Chapin Hall, and actually Amy Dworsky um, and I worked on a uh, pregnancy and pregnant and parenting teen um, project for um, adolescents who are in the foster care system. And one of the really interesting findings from the work that um, I remember from that project was the concern that providers had about um, adolescents with mental health needs. Can you talk more about your partnerships um, at both the program and the system level um, as they relate to the mental health needs of uh, adolescents who are either pregnant or parenting. So the um, mental health needs, despite pregnancy, <laughs> are huge. Um, and the resources and capacity are barely anything. Um, so it is a, it is, a, you know, if we were to have another crisis conversation, that would be the mental health of our adolescents um, and the supports around mental health and social emotional well-being of adolescents. It is, it is a crisis and is a contributor to teen pregnancy for sure, as uh, Karen spoke earlier about trauma. Um, so I think that, 
you know, we are recently actually having multiple conversations around the Affordable Care Act and how much opportunity that will bring, we are hoping, to increasing access and availability to mental health services for adolescents. Um, as of, you know, right now, the services, particularly in Chicago, I can't really speak nationally, um, are so small and so sort of, you know, issue specific um, and insurance specific that it, it, it's very challenging for adolescents. And, and I think that, you know, I want to believe in 2014 when ACA is in, is, is in action that, you know, we will have, we, I hope that there are more agencies that are building capacity to be able to provide the mental health, the substance abuse support that, that teens need. Um, but right now, this is a, a very serious crisis, and the, the resources are not available to address these needs, which you know I think is why it is so important that healthcare providers, particularly with um, you know pregnant teens, um, assuming they're getting prenatal care, um, that they are being that they are incredibly adolescent competent, that they are doing um, comprehensive risk assessments, that they are the ones who are providing the education and counseling, um, because right now there aren't many other options in, as a provider. I'm <laughs> sure. So I have the ability to serve parenting, so pregnant parenting, so not non-pregnant. So with the parenting piece, when a low-income um, teen a uh, mom on the south side with these zip codes get, becomes pregnant, then a part of our services, we have nurse home partnerships, so the Evans Space um, Nurse Home Visiting Program, and we're funded by the Ounce of Prevention Fund, so we also have uh, a mental health. So as soon as you are enrolled in our program, you have the capacity to benefit from our mental health consultant who's in-house. So then I don't, if the clients, and you don't have to be a patient of mercy, it's community um, funding and accessible, and it's free and voluntary, but if you, have a prior like mental health history or trauma or substance abuse or if we just I, that's why I said just unresolved trauma which they bring with them then we have all these assessments of course that the nurses are doing but then we also have um, the mental health consultant who's helping with our own capacity and training so they can the clients can receive individual or group therapy from our mental health consultant but then they can also come to group and the group that we're now doing now is heart to heart around how do you empower teen um, mothers to prevent child abuse and what does that look like um, for people who may tend to, um, for lack of a better term, prey on children of teen moms because of what that all that entails. And so I agree, you, you definitely, because again, the milieu in which you have teen pregnancy and parenting occurring, we are trying to modify those um, behaviors because that maladaptive bonding and attachment that maybe birthed this experience, we want to help modify that for the mom and the father and then like the whole family unit that's or that circle of support so that the bonding and attachment for the child occurs. And so I think it's essential. I'm very um, fortunate to have my mental own, my own mental health consultant so I don't have to refer out, but I know that's not everybody's um, luck, and so we're just fortunate that I have one, and, and she's she's with us, and I don't have to worry about what happened to on a state level. <laughs> there is a, also a question on the web about youth in foster care and the teen pregnancy issue. What are the special challenges that those youth face, other than the mental health issue? There's the disconnection with family. Do either of your programs work with youth who have experienced foster care, and what can you say about those? particular challenges? Uh, we have done some work. We haven't done as much in, in regards to uh, uh, going to a lot of the, some of the uh, uh, group homes and work there and do some presentations there. But we haven't done as much as we'd like to in regards to we just have a limited amount of guys to be able to do that. Uh, uh, that's something that we're looking to try to, uh, to add on and do some more of in the future, though. <clears throat> Other questions? Uh, first there, and then uh, the woman behind you. Uh, my name's Erin Berenger. I'm with Planned Parenthood of Illinois. Um, I think that um, teen pregnancy research and programs oftentimes kind of focus on the concept of intendedness as like a binary variable. variable. So it's either, you know, it wasn't intended or it was intended and we're trying to address behavior. Um, but I know that there's a growing body of research that suggests that for a lot of teens that's a really murky question, especially in urban environments where you've got folks that, 
you know, are dealing with, you know, low opportunity, there's not a lot of jobs, there's a lot of violence, and this touches on something that Roger said before about, you know, why use a condom, I might not be here next year. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious um, if you could speak about what kind of programs are in place in Chicago when it comes to, you know, a girl who says, you know, well, if I got pregnant, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, it's about my legacy, it's a valid life choice for me, it's fine, it might not be the best thing for my kid, but it's okay. What programs are in place in Chicago right now that are kind of addressing that particular aspect of it? So the the specific program that's um, that is explicitly dealing with teen pregnancy prevention in Chicago public schools is called Teen Outreach Program, and it is um, not it is a youth development program with you know. Um, 15% focused on sex education and this in focusing on this issue around um, what you're speaking of. And so I think that and many of these 28 interventions that were sort of put out there for, for folks to choose from to try to replicate um, really are, I think, moving away from that notion and, and, and going back to, I just, I don't know, old days, when you focused on building skills with youth and skills with children um, on, you know, how to talk to each other, how when you're angry, how to react to being angry, what's appropriate responses, um, how you should have relationships, regardless if they're sexual or non-sexual. Um, so it, thinking more about building um, interpersonal skills and interrelational skills so that people are able to, you know, not just be in the moment, um, but, but be thoughtful and mindful and informed. And I think, you know, and really working on ensuring that there's an adult that you can connect with and ensuring that there is this peer connection and support and peer reinforcement of positive behavior um, versus this, um, you know, placing judgment on parenting decisions or not, or having sex decisions or not, but more about everything that you need to know before you make that decision to have sex and really focusing on all of that um, instead of just, you know, saying, you know, you really should wait to have sex, pregnancy is bad, and if you do have sex, use a condom, and this is how you use a condom, and like focusing on the, on the mechanics of safe sex. So I think that that's a, a huge and important shift, and, and I hope that the evaluation shows that there is, you know, that, that youth are delaying the onset of sexual behavior, um, which will then, you know, decrease teen birth rate. So I think that there is an, a national shift to move the, the thought around that, and I, I you know, it, it seems that that's what's happening. So I, I think related, I don't know if this is on, but I think related to that is um, when we, you know, in Trump, what do you say if the teen says that it doesn't matter, this is what I want now? I guess other than the piece of, okay, you know, like Yamani and Karen mentioned where you actually support them, I think part of it is educated. I mean, it is still their choice, but a lot of the research that's looking, uh, this, most of the research, I will say, does not look simply only at, you know, is it a binary, did they get pregnant or not? But it also looks at related outcomes. So if you look at it, so if you're doing it in a school setting, like we are with TOP, and you look at educational outcomes. So I guess the, the hope and the expectation is that if you start focusing on all of that, they will, it's just, I think it's really a learned behavior where they learn and realize for themselves that, no, they should care about the other things. It should not, I mean, you want to shift away from saying, I don't care if I can provide or not. But if you realize that, okay, this is something that, you know, you can do it all, perhaps, without the support, um, and you probably have a better chance of providing for that child if you have, if you are better positioned to have a better income or, you know, have better housing, uh, that you will consciously make that choice eventually. Um, I don't it doesn't probably answer directly, but I think the idea is to like shift or just really help make that decision as informed as possible that fewer and fewer will actually end up saying that I don't really care. I, I'm going to have the child anyway. But they do. So that's what I'm saying. Like I, said, I think it's the framework and when you ask the question and I think in, and how you engage that you to even ask how do we get here? Um, because I do have girls in my program who were like, we didn't use a condom. And she's like, so clearly we didn't, it didn't matter if we were going to parent because we were going to parent. 
but you're like 16 or you're 17. And so that's, and I hear what you're saying. So I, I think that's also another a leap, I think, for this public consciousness to accept that a teen wants to be pregnant and parent. And so are we ready for that? I don't know. But I still believe we need to support them because like I said, the choice has been made, so how do we support them? Um, but I don't even know if there are, uh, you know, like if there's the research out there or the evaluations to even explore that. Because I feel like that goes into a field of that whole reflection and motivational interviewing and mental health where you have the skills to draw that information out for someone when you're looking at intent or um, the conditions behind someone's motivation to do something. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> Great, your question now. Hi, my name is uh, Nathina Fields and I'm a grad student and I'm also a very bitter former ward of Illinois. My question is really for Rupa as well as for uh, Jamie. My question is regarding um, access to healthcare for former wards um, and for prevention. And I wanna open this up also to social workers that might be here as well as those that are um, with us virtually. Um, here we have, unlike some of the, the young adults that might come to Rogers um, Peer Advocacy, we have, if you're a ward of the court, um, access to a medical card, okay? Now that seems to be a big issue for me, and I know this from personal experience, that here we are, you don't have, foster parents are not, or even social workers allowing these children or these young girls to have access to reproductive services that are out there for them that can be paid for and they do have access for that. So rather than just simply going into policy and saying that yes, there's a policy that obviously as a foster care um, parent that you should be taking them to the doctor and you should be having this conversation, what are we doing to make this an actionable directive for social workers and foster care parents to have this conversation and their monthly visits, in their annual visits, whenever they get to see them, we know that that's not always all the time. When, how do we get to that as a practicality? Because you know, my biggest issue is that there's no reason why you should have a medical card, you should have this access. It can be paid for, and yet the conversation is not there. It's not happening. So I'd like to know, outside of just the policy, Rupa, and even Jamie, if you can comment on this, as well as any social workers here, how can we get this done? So I am going to invite Amy Dworsky to answer this question because I think she's amongst the best people. She has the mic in her hand. As, as Rupa mentioned um, during her presentation, um, I'm involved right now with DCFS. Um, they are implementing a training for foster parents and caseworkers, training them on healthy sexual development for youth in care. And part of that training does involve exactly what you just said, so that the foster parents and caseworkers are told about the official policy. They are given resources as far as where they can take youth um, to get the kind of health care you're talking about and about talking with youth about these issues. So I, I think that DCF is, is moving in the direction of addressing the concerns you raised. And I would just add, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to diminish this, this conversation, but this is, this, you, Wards, adolescent wards are not alone because that is the adolescent population, period. Um, and, you know, most, you know, some may not have access to insurance. So, you know, certainly wards have are, are, are better positioned because they absolutely do have the access. But adolescents do not have the information and healthcare providers do not have the responsiveness to provide these important services to adolescents. So, in you know, in fact, adolescents do have the right to receive confidential services without their parent permission um, at any point in time from a health care provider. They do have the right to receive substance abuse services and mental health services without their parents' knowledge or consent um, up to a certain degree. So I think that we, we um, and the city is working on this with a huge um, group of, of reproductive and adolescent health advocates to ensure that the information is available and accessible to adolescents, that they, these are your rights. You can access these services. You should access these services. And on the flip side, healthcare providers, you must provide these services. You need to provide these services. 
and most importantly, in an adolescent competent manner. Um, you cannot just send an adolescent to any healthcare provider and expect that to be a um, successful experience. Um, and, and certainly we know that you know, health behaviors and, and all behaviors are, are developing and formed and, and, and done by the time you're an adolescent. So if you have a bad experience at a healthcare provider, well, you may not be getting healthcare until your you know, emergency occurs. And, and that's not where we wanna be either. So um, the city is working on that and, we're, and, and, and I think that you raise a really good point. Um, we do have DCFS on our, on our advisory board and, and this hasn't come up, and I think that we, and I'm glad I didn't know about this, this work group either, and, this, and so I think this is really exciting. Um, so let's hope that future adolescent wards are not experiencing this due to these efforts, um, and, and adolescents in general um, will, will have the information they need to access the care that they should and they deserve. So just uh, a very quickly, one, two sentences, that uh, in terms of what, what is the access that adolescents in general have we're hoping that, you know, so we have this opportunity with TOP where we are reaching over 8,000 kids, adolescents, so we are taking that opportunity to learn from them uh, whether they have access and, and in fact, the extent that is it, you know, do they feel comfortable going there and we're, we're ha actually have singled out mental health care, in fact. So hopefully in a few years we'll know whether uh, for adolescents in general, at least from this, from this sub, some the sample, whether they have, you know, what the state of affairs is, and for those kids who are um, in uh, have, have top, whether that engagement, that education, that awareness has hopefully increased their reaching out and getting access. Great. We have time for perhaps one more question. We'll go to the gentleman in the back. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Soresby. I'm with, uh, I'm with Children's Home and Aid with the Career Pregnancy Prevention Program. And uh, we know that young people, uh, like when they see that life will get better, that they'll make better choices. Uh, so what, what I would like you guys to comment on is that how important uh, is some type of job component with all of this? Because uh, part of that is that any program that they participate in, you know, they hope that it's gonna help them get a job later. And recently, I had a young person express to me that, well, if the economy is so messed up now, where that if someone that is from a good neighborhood and actually has a good education, and if they can't get a job, then what hope is there for me? You know, so if you guys can comment on how important that is with all of this. It's an excellent question. Roger, do you want to take uh, uh, a stab at that? Yeah, you know, for us as, in our program, as we're training guys, that's a big component for us to be able to uh, give them the employability skills that they need. But the, but the next phase or the next piece of it is that we sponsor workshops in the community to help young men and women to develop their resumes, talk about what particular employment opportunities may be available. And then we have another club that we sponsor where guys can come uh, to the, to the uh, gyms on Thursday nights and just vent and talk about their particular situations. And we talk about what they need to do to be prepared in the future if opportunities do become available. Because as we all know, uh, uh, the economic climate now is very tough out here for our adolescents in regards to employment. And so what we do is we just try to prepare them the best we can and talk about what they can do for future opportunities because we know all the employment opportunities aren't available. Now on the other end, see I've seen employment on the other end, I work with also with young fathers. That's a big issue with young fathers, okay? Uh, we have a program with the Illinois Subsequent Pregnancy Project and the first thing when the young fathers come in the door, they talk about, well, I need to work. And these are some young fathers that are between the age of 16 through 24. Some of them haven't graduated from high school. Uh, they had limited skills. When I say they haven't graduated from high school, they may be uh, 17, 18 years old, but they may be reading at a sixth or seventh grade level. They don't understand it. They're not even prepared to begin a GED program. They're actually what should be in what's called a remediation program. So. We have to learn to work with them, and I have to tell them, like, like, you know, a big part of you being a parent is 
you developing the skills to be a parent, but also we got to work on your skills to get where you need to be to become employed. And you know, it's real hard. It, that's a very hard thing to do. Uh, we try to work with some agencies around that. One of uh, the agencies that's on the west side that we work with in uh, Chicago is called Father Cares. Uh, Walter Jones, he runs that. Uh, he does a good job in regards to uh, helping us plug in and get the resources that we need. But no, that's very difficult in regards to adolescent employment. Thank you. I'm afraid that we are done with our formal program at this point. Uh, I think we could probably continue talking about this for days, and I hope that we will continue that conversation online. I hope our panel can stay for a few minutes and folks can approach and uh, get to know them in person if they would like to do that. So first I'd like to thank the panel for taking the time to raise these issues. Obviously we didn't solve them, but I hope everybody learned something uh, that they can take back into their continued efforts to resolve these important issues. So thank you to the panel. And thank you to the audience uh, in person as well as online.